Hey guys, today's episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast with Max Garcia, Arizona Cardinals offensive lineman. Man, does he have an amazing testimony of faith in the Lord. Today's episode is presented by our friends at Compassion International, great partners with us now for three plus years at Sports Spectrum. And we've told you about Fill the Stadium. That's the place to go. Fillthestadium.com. The website is the place to go to learn more about the work Compassion is doing standing in the gap during this pandemic, which hopefully is on its way out. But there is a bunch of kids that have been left without a child sponsorship, without food and education and medical care, vocational training, the basic necessities that every child deserves. Well, there's a lot of children right now and their families who are in dire need of help because of the pandemic. Initially, it was 70,000 kids who are going to be left without a sponsorship through Compassion because of the pandemic. That number is lower now, thankfully. We've hit about 70% of the way to our goal of 70,000 kids, but there's still quite a few kids and their families that need help. And that's where you and I can come in and donate and be a part of Fill the Stadium with Compassion. Go to fillthestadium.com to donate, pray, and make sure that this is not a stadium that can remain empty. We have to do our due diligence to save these children and their families from poverty. Fillthestadium.com. Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports collide. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Welcome, everyone, to the show. So glad that you're tuning in to our Sports Spectrum Podcast today. My name is Jason. We have a great conversation coming up with Max Garcia, the Arizona Cardinals offensive lineman, Super Bowl champion. Max has an amazing story, amazing testimony of faith that he shares here on the show today. Before we get to Max, I want to tell you about our website, sportspectrum.com. Make sure you go check that out for all of our content. It's the place to bookmark. You want to know about stories on the intersection of sports and faith. See, we bring Jesus back into the sports conversation. You can read about people like Max Garcia, stories on athletes, coaches, teams, Man, check out sportspectrum.com, the website. You can read those stories. You can also get every podcast there that we have on our Sports Spectrum Podcast Network, and you can get a devotional every single day at 6 a.m. Eastern, a great way to start your day right with God, right there at sportspectrum.com. And when you're at the website, do us a favor, sign up for our newsletter, our weekly newsletter. It's free and available for you to sign up right now. All you got to do is put in your email address and we'll send you our Sports Spectrum Weekly, which is a kind of a breakdown of all that you may have missed with regards to Sports Spectrum, the stories, the podcast, the, the devotionals. They all come your way through Sports Spectrum Weekly. It's free. Click that newsletter icon and sign up today at sportspectrum.com. Max Garcia is our guest today, and my goodness, does he have a testimony to share about coming to faith in Jesus. So Max, right now, Arizona Cardinals offensive lineman. He's going to be getting his third season with Arizona. He signed a one-year deal back in March of 2021. So here he is in his seventh NFL season and his third with the Cardinals. He was originally selected in the fourth round of the 2015 NFL Draft by the Denver Broncos. And you might be thinking, if you're a Broncos fan, hmm, 2015, yep, he comes into the league, and what does he do? He wins a Super Bowl. He was a member of that Super Bowl 50 Broncos championship team in 2015, his rookie year in the NFL, and he wins a Super Bowl. And he alludes to this on the show, it's the last time he made the playoffs. So that's how hard it is, not only to win a Super Bowl, but to make the playoffs in the NFL Max did it his rookie year and hasn't been back since, but I think I have a sneaking suspicion that 2021 might be a playoff year for him. His Arizona Cardinals team looks stacked and uh, ready for a potential playoff run. Max played with the Broncos from 2015 to 2018, and as I mentioned, came to Arizona in 2019, where he's still there, and again, in his third season with the Cardinals. He played his college football at Maryland and then transferred to Florida, and that's important because that's part of the testimony that Max Garcia shares here today on the show. Let's take a listen to Arizona Cardinals offensive lineman Max Garcia here on Sports Spectrum. Hey, 
Hey, Max, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Good to connect with you. It's the off season here. How has the off season been going? This is what year? I think is this year seven for you in the NFL? Yeah. Yeah. Going on to year seven. Um, off season has been cool. Uh, well, not so cool out here training in Arizona, but um, <laughs> it's been going well, man. Been been lifting a lot of weights and uh, feeling good, kind of cutting down on weight. So it's kind of my favorite part of the year. At this stage of your career, how has your off-season preparation changed or evolved compared to when you first came into the league? Uh, first couple of years into the league, I had no idea what I was doing in the off-season. Like, I would take, you know, a train and then take weeks off and then, you know, go back to training. And I was like, man, this is like, this is really hard. So what I've been doing is kind of just like training the whole time, you know, even if it's just a couple of days a week. Um yeah, just taking that route instead of, you know, stopping and starting. And then, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot easier on the body just to, you know, keep it going and kind of just like build into it until, you know, training camp hits. And this team that you're on, there's a lot of excitement and buzz around this team with Arizona and you've been a part of it, you know, in the off seasons and OTAs and things like that. It's gotta be an exciting time right now to be a Cardinal. This is your third year, but they've made some moves and have some guys that are really hitting their stride off of a promising season last year. It's gotta be an exciting time to be an Arizona Cardinal right now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is the first time that I've been in the same offense for three consecutive years. So I'm excited about even, you know, just that aspect of it, but just, you know, having everybody learning the same offense and the same defense and having that kind of continuity, um, I think it's going to be crucial. And then obviously you add in, you know, the free agency acquisitions. Um, yeah, I'm just super excited about the season. I can't, you know, I couldn't be more excited. I'm just imagining you as, you know, at training camp with the pads on uh, blocking JJ Watt, you know, at practice <laughs> every day. Uh, it's like, thank God it's practice, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, definitely. We've had our, we've had our bouts um, in the past when I was in Denver um, he's a, he's a great player. He adds, you know, a lot of value, you know, to the locker room and, uh, I can already see, you know, guys, you know, looking, looking, you know, up to him. So, um, yeah, definitely better to have him on, on our side than, you know, the opposing side. Absolutely. Now you mentioned Denver, you won a Super Bowl there in your first season, which I've talked to a few people. I remember Prince of Mukamura came on our show and he won his Super Bowl his rookie year as well. And you kind of think, oh, this is what it's going to be like every year. And it's hard to win a Super Bowl, but you got one your first season. That was actually Peyton Manning's last season with the Denver Broncos when you came into the league. Describe that experience, if you could, of winning what I like to just say is winning football's last game of the year, which only one <laughs> team gets to do. What was right. that like? I mean, like you said, I had not I had no idea. I had no idea, you know, just how – abnormal that season was you know the the vets were telling me like man like a lot of teams don't even make it to the playoffs like let alone you know get into the you know championship game of sorry it's my my dog Dino in the back okay. um and uh yeah so like making it to the Super Bowl I mean that was like obviously you know something that I've always dreamt of doing and then you add on you know playing with Peyton Manning DeMarcus Ware Von Miller you know, Louis Vasquez, who, you know, took me under his wing, Ryan Harris. I mean, like all these guys that, you know, just mean so much to me now. Um, and just kind of like building those. It, it's literally like a brotherhood now. Like, you know, I, I just those guys, you know, are just like kind of in my circle. And, um, you know, I just enjoy, you know, being part of part of that team and uh, haven't been to the playoffs since. So <laughs> right, that shows you how hard yeah. it is, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's, it's humbled me. Um, so yeah, um, I know, you know, the work that it takes to get there and to be that type of uh, team. So that's kind of like hoping that's what I'm hoping to add, you know, to the Cardinals is that, you know, the experience and kind of just like knowing what it takes to get there. What was your favorite moment or memory from the Super Bowl for you? Man, just uh, having my family there, honestly. Um, you know, my mom got to come down, my, my brother and my sister, and uh, they got to come down, you know, on the field. I had um, some of family, we're a family of seven. Mm. Um, so I only had, you know, a certain amount of tickets for the people that could, you know, come on the field afterwards. But just having everybody there and enjoying the, the experience with me, um, that's definitely the pinnacle. I feel like, you know, that's what it's all about, you know, just – 
it's, it's cool to achieve those things and, you know, achieve, you know, certain levels of success. But if you have no one to celebrate it with, then, you know, what does it really matter? So having them there was definitely the highlight. And even though it was his last year, I have to imagine there was some awesome moments just being around Peyton Manning, right? And learning from him and seeing the kind of leader that he was. What was it that stood out to you? You know, maybe the talent level wasn't where he was at his prime because it was his last year, but he's still Peyton Manning and there's still so much to learn from a person in just the five or six or eight months or whatever it was that you were with him. Uh, what was it that stood out that, you know, as the Hall of Famer and leader that we all see from afar, you got to kind of experience that up close? Yeah, so, um, you know, I was a uh, I was drafted in the fourth round, so I was a day three guy. And, um, like, I thought it was so cool that he texted me when I got drafted. That was, like, the first, you know, interaction, you know, that I had with Peyton. And I was just like, I was looking at my phone. That was, I don't even know, like, I felt like even that was more kind of, like, memorable than the call. Yeah. Um, you know, getting that text from Peyton. It was like, hey, it's, it's Peyton Manning, and, like, I'm super excited to start working with you. And I was just like, man, that's super dope. Um, yeah. But and he didn't have to do that, right, Max? Oh, I mean, nah. You were uh, a fourth-round pick. He could have just been like, you know, I'll see you at OTAs yeah. or training camp, and here we go. Right. right. Um, and actually, my first day at the facility, like, he comes up to me and, like, introduces himself. And I was like, that's, that's, that's what makes him, you know, who he is. That's what makes him a leader, um, mm -hmm. kind of just like – interacting with the guys and just being one of the guys, you know, he's just so down to earth, you know, he's on these commercials and um, he has his own show and he's like, you know, cracking all these jokes and stuff, but like, that's how he is like all the time. It's not a, it's not a facade. And, and yeah, it was like, definitely that's, that's what kind of makes him a leader is just how genuine he is uh, on a day to day. And then compound that with a guy like Kyler Murray, who you're playing with now and is your quarterback, a young stud. And you got a veteran there in Colt McCoy as well, who came in this year. And, but Kyler is a completely different QB on the field than Peyton Manning was. But he really came into his own last year, I think, in his second year. You've been there since he's been there, right? So this is your third year. This is his third year with Arizona. What's it been like to watch the development on the other side of it, right? Going from a veteran like Peyton who was in his last year and going to the hall of fame and all these accomplishments and Kyler, who was coming in as a highly touted first round, number one overall pick. And you get to be around him and watch him develop the last few years. Yeah. So, I mean, from, from year one to year two, there was a tremendous jump and just like confidence, um, playing level and, um, yeah, just like him just being comfortable, you know, being back there and kind of just like taking control of, of things. I think that's one thing that's, you know, kind of hard to do um, being a rookie, especially a rookie quarterback, is to come in there, you know, and take charge. Um, but obviously, you know, as a as a quarterback, you want to be the guy that's out there leading. Obviously, you know, we had Larry, you know, out there who is, you know, always a, a team captain and um, but, you know, you want to have that type of leadership from your quarterback position as well. So just from, from the from the steps that he took from year one to year two, I mean, I'm just I couldn't be, you know, more excited about him, you know, heading into year three, too. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he, he, he's he's going to be he's, he's a real deal. He's a real deal. The things that he does is I'm like in the situations that he gets us out of and the types of plays that he makes. Um, yeah, just super, super uh, thankful to be a part of, you know, um, his, his journey. Let's take a quick break from our conversation here on sports spectrum to tell you a little bit more about Phil, the stadium and our friends at compassion international. Now, you know, about compassion, they are the most trusted child development ministry in the world. All that they do is about children and releasing them from poverty. They do it all in Jesus name. And now we have this Fill the Stadium initiative that's been going on for more than a year now, and we're making such amazing progress, trying to fill 70,000 empty seats with children who are in crisis. 70,000 kids were left without an opportunity for food and shelter and clothing and all the basic necessities that children should have. Normally, they would get sponsored in a regular year, but the pandemic wiped all of that out. And so now you can come alongside myself, our friends at Compassion, our pro athlete friends, and help fill the stadium and release kids from poverty. You can go to the website, fillthestadium.com to donate right now 
fillthestadium.com, and let's release these kids from poverty. Let's reach our goal of 70,000 filled seats. Go to fillthestadium.com. You're listening to Max Garcia here on Sports Spectrum. He's the Arizona Cardinals offensive lineman. We have the intersection of sports and faith, Max. And let's intersect the conversation, if you will, with faith. Why don't you tell us about your testimony, maybe share your testimony and, you know, your walk with the Lord and its importance in your life. Yeah. Um, so the condensed version, because <laughs> we can get into it. You know, you, you tell the you tell the part you want to tell in this answer, and then we'll get we'll follow up. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. So I um I grew up in a in a Catholic household. My 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 mom really was the one who kind of introduced us to the to the church. Um, I'm Puerto Rican and Mexican, so Catholicism is kind of like culturally what sure. uh, what we practice. Um, so I grew up, you know doing my confirmation, um, you know, Sunday school, you know, I was an altar boy for, for a few, couple of years. So church, I was, you know, very accustomed to, but it was definitely something that, you know, I did, you know, kind of to appease my parents. Um, but I never really, you know, enjoyed going, never really wanted to go. Um, I was always trying to, you know, play outside while the surface was going and things like that. Um, and then my parents separated when I was about nine or 10. And then after they separated, I kind of took it as an opportunity to not go to church. My mom, I guess she like didn't want, you know, kind of to put that like over me or like, you know, add something else to like I didn't want to do. She understood like that I was going through a hard time, you know, with the with the separation. So I felt like she didn't want to, you know, force me to go to church on top of that. So I, I didn't go. Um, then I get to high school and um we start having uh, conversations, you know, about, about Jesus. And, you know, we, we bring a, the chaplain in and he gives us a devotional before the games. Uh, my offensive line coach, uh, Dale Farr, you know, he's a, he's a man of God, mm. um, you know, like didn't ever curse and, you know, use every, you know, every word, you know, besides the curse words. So I always thought that was funny. <laughs> um, but um yeah. So like, you know, it kind of that was kind of like, you know, seeds being being, you know, planted in my life. Then I remember for I think it was my 17th birthday, um, my mom was driving or 16th, 16 or 17th birthday. My mom was uh, driving me to workouts one morning and like I was like, mom, like, like, I know that I in my head, the I know that I love you. And like, that's, you know, kind of like trying to do it logically. Like, I know that I love you like you're my mom. But like, there's something, you know, in my heart that I feel like is is missing. Like, I feel like there's just like a void there. And I don't know why, but I think I need a Bible, you know, for my birthday. Mm. And um, I, I never understood like how, I don't know, just like, I don't, I don't even know like the word for it, but just how, like what, what, like what a kind of emptiness, you know, that I had, you know, inside. You know, they're like, just, they're, there's such a, like a void in me that I didn't even understand until later on, you know, when I got, when I, when I surrendered my life to Christ. So I was, uh, I was putting myself, you know, in, into these environments, you know, learning about Jesus, young life and, you know, FCA and all those type of things in high school. And, um, but never, never really, you know, took that next step. And then I get to college, um, and, you know, I feel like everybody has that story, you know, going off to college, I'm going to do me, yeah. you know, I'm going to, you know, be with the boys and, you know, try to, you know, just be one of the guys and, you know, you know, I want, I want to be part of the team. I want to feel like I'm, you know, left out. So, you know, we're going to the bars, you know, we're, we're drinking and, and we're, we're partying, we're doing all those, all those things. And I was, I was doing that, you know, my first year had a lot of success, you know, on the football field. I was like one of 10 true freshmen to ever play offensive line for Ralph Friesian, mm -hmm. um, which was like a, a really big deal uh, to play as a, as a true freshman uh, for him. Um, so like, you know, things were going well. And then second year comes in. Well, after, after, after um, my first year, Coach Friesian, um, uh, he resigns or he gets like a, um, and Randy Edsel comes in and then that season was like not the way that it was supposed to go. And um, 
you know, we ended up going two and 10 um, on, on the season. So at that time, you know, football was everything. So it, it affected, you know, my, my mood. Um, it affected my academics, yeah. you know, social life, everything. And on top of that, I had a really bad breakup with my uh, high school sweetheart. Um, we had been dating about, you know, four, four years at, um, by that time of my sophomore year in college. Yeah. And um, so that was like super hard. Um, it was a really bad breakup. Um, and uh, I felt like I went into like a, a depression, you know, after that time and um, made a bad, made a bad choice academically. I let one of my teammates copy one of my papers um, and then we get busted for that. Mm. And then my uh, academic advisor, he's like hitting me up. He's like, Hey, why haven't you received a grade in this class? And mind you, like, I, like, I never got in trouble. Like I was, I was a good dude. <laughs> right. I, was yeah. a good kid. I never missed a day of school from kindergarten to 12th grade. Like literally didn't miss one day of school. Wow. Um, I was in the IB AP program, all that stuff. So like, I, I, I enjoyed, you know, going to school. So like, I knew like this was, this was bad. You know, so um, so that happens um, over winter break. I get the news. My my teacher tells me like, hey, yeah, I sent you guys this paper to the to the honor board and you guys are going to have a hearing in March. And uh, until you, you know, do that hearing, like, you know, you may or may not be kicked out of, out of the University of Maryland. So I, I think my life is over and uh, I'm the I'm the first one of the of the kids to go to college. And I think I'm about to break this news, you know, to my mom. And I'm like, there's no way I can break this news to her. Like she's like, she's going to break down and cry. Like I can't do that to mom. Right. And so I, I didn't tell her, um, I actually haven't told her, hadn't told her until yesterday, literally yesterday. <laughs> I told her that. You know? Really? Like as in the day yeah. before we're recording this. Wow. Yes. yes. Um, uh, we we have a family Bible study, and I was uh, sharing my testimony actually. So okay, back to back days. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm dealing with this. You know, this is hanging hanging over my head. You know, the whole semester. And that winter for Christmas, my dad had given me a couple thousand dollars for you know child support that he had missed over the years. Okay, and I bought my mom a TV. I got myself like a new, you know, a new outfit, some couple of jeans and some boots. And literally the rest of that money went to the bars. I was, I was drinking almost like every night. Um, mm. It was a time in my life where I, like, it was definitely like the, the, the darkest time in my life. Um, I remember, you know, just going to the bars like every night. So I had been relieved. So I asked, you know, for, for, for a relief, you know, from the team. Um, for permission to transfer. So like, I didn't have any more football activities, you know, the, from, from February, you know, on. Yeah. And uh, so I was a regular student, you know, so all I had to do was go to class and like, I was never had experienced, you know, that lifestyle, even in, you know, high school, because I was always in football or, or track and field. So I was always, you know, doing something active, but, you know, this time I, I was just, you know, putting all my time, you know, into the bars and drinking. Um, so I went through that phase and I just knew like I needed something like else. I knew I needed to leave Maryland, but obviously I couldn't do that if I had an XF, like I wouldn't be able to transfer to another school if I had an XF on my transcript. Right. So this honor board hearing comes up and mind you, I hadn't, I hadn't spoken, you know, to my teammate that, um the situation um occurred with um so like we didn't we didn't conspire or anything like we didn't talk to each other we didn't like this is the story we're going to tell like we both went in there not hadn't talked to each other like honestly like furious probably with each other I know I was mad at him but I, I don't know if he was mad at me or not but I knew, I knew I was extremely mad at him sure um because he didn't change the answers and and like I did right but um, so we go in there and we tell the truth. We tell, we tell, we tell them exactly what happened. And they honored that. They were like, this is the first time two people have come in here and not lied to us or like not try to fabricate, not try to, you know, come up with an intricate story 
like you guys literally came in here and told the truth and like or like cried <laughs> you know and like you know yeah. we're really you know just like ex ex extremely regretful and you know just had a you know just a lot of you know just you know remorse you know for what we had just done and and it was and it, it was genuine it was it was really genuine like i i, I didn't you know want to get access like and i just I, I just knew that you know telling the truth would kind of just like put it in their hands and like they would just have to accept you know what we did and so they honored that they didn't put an xf on our transcript and uh, they just gave us a zero in the class instead so after that that was like my first like breath of, of freedom you know i just had this weight you know hanging over me the whole semester and then after i had that honor board hearing and knowing that i was just going to get a zero in the class like obviously it was going to hurt my gpa but it wasn't going to pre prevent me from getting um, uh, uh, being recruited and, you know, being able to transfer. So I get a um, so there's a GA at Florida at UF by the name of Bush Hamden. Um, shout out to my, my guy, Bush. Um, he for some reason, like him and I got close while he was at Maryland. And he had moved to uh, Florida and was a, and was a GA at the time. And he was like, "Hey, man, like I just talked to Coach Muschamp about you, and I think he wants to offer you a scholarship to Florida." And I was like, "What? Like, are you kidding me? Like, nobody makes this, you know, type of move, you know, from the ACC to the SEC. Usually, you know, it's kind of like the other way around, you know, or you know, I was thinking I was going to go to a D two school. You know, I think I was thinking I was going to, you know, play at." you know, a, a D3 school in, in Texas somewhere, <laughs> you right. know, yeah. was the worst, you know, the worst of the worst, JUCO. Like, I just thought, you know, football for me, like, was going to have, I was going to have to rebuild. But, um, yeah, he reaches out to me and, and he offers me. And then after that, like, every top school, you know, in the nation uh, starts to offer me, you know, Georgia, Wisconsin, uh, Ole Miss, Southern Cal, which was my dream school coming out of high school. Hmm. Um, so I took, you know, my five official visits to those schools and, you know, and I'm older now, you know, in high school, when you do these official visits, like you have no idea, right. you know, like what to do when you get to these college campuses. But now I'm older. I've been on college for two years. Like I know the, I know how it works. And so like, I took full advantage of that. You know, I was going out, I was partying, you know, I was meeting all these people and, you know, just kind of, you know, doing my thing, you know, thinking I was, you know, a big shot, you know, because I was like one of the highest uh, you know, touted recruits at that time. Um, so something tells me like, because, because, you know, Florida was the first big school to offer me, I kind of like just that, that held a lot of weight, you know, for me. And so I was like, you know what, I'm a, I'm a honor that like, they, they really like took a chance on me and like, I, I know Bush and I know he's gonna, you know, I know he's going to take care of me when, when I'm down there. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a commit to Florida. So I commit to Florida and then on my on my official visit, well, on my official visit there, I uh, ran into this girl named Kayla Lewis, who I played basketball at UF too. Okay. And uh, at that time, she had just got saved, and she asked me what I had given up for Lent, and I was like, honestly, like I I, I stopped listening like to to rap, and I'm just like listening to Christian hip hop, hmm. and I had no idea why I gave that up for Lent, but I just did. And my brother and my, my older brother and my oldest sister, Fabian and Lucila, they had given me um, a Lecrae CD um, and some other, you know, uh, Christian hip hop artists. Yeah. Uh, CD, and I had had them on me and I had listened to them like sporadically, but like, honestly, like not understanding, you know, what their message was. And like, you know, they were talking about, you know, making, you know, Jesus cool and like rapping about Jesus and stuff like that. And I would, I would remember, you know, some of their songs just because like, I, I can remember songs easily. Yeah. Um, and so I, I did, I gave that up and I was listening to that and she was like, wow, like that's so dope. You know, like you should definitely come to Florida, blah, blah. blah. And I was like, yeah, like, I'm, I really like, you know, I really like it here. So I, I might, so I ended up, you know, going there and um, my my first day at Florida, um, this guy by the name of Gideon is talking to me and he, he's like, hey, man, did you know that God sends down lightning to the mark? And, <laughs> and I lightning was like, to the mark. 
I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, man, like, since God is like all sovereign, like anything that happens in this world, like he intended it for it to happen. So like if he sends down lightning, like he meant for it to strike there. And I was just like, I was like, all right, bro, <laughs> like, that's cool. Like, I guess I never, you know, thought about it that way. But yeah, like, <laughs> you got a point. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you got, yeah, I guess you got to have a point. And so I started, I started to, you know, have, have more conversations with them. And he got, ended up being uh, one of my roommates. And um, man, we had so many conversations about Jesus and everybody around me was talking about Jesus. And they introduced me to Kevin Sides, who's a who's an AIA um, a minister at, at, at UF. Yeah. And um, I started, you know, having conversations with him. And Kayla, Kayla took me to him, and Gideon took me to him. And they're like, "You got to meet Max. Like this dude is like saved, and and all, you know, he's like he's super Christian." And then they took me through the little pamphlet book, and I was like, "It's Jesus." Uh, it was like a little diagram, and it was like yeah. it's is Jesus like in the circle or is he like out of the circle? Like, is he in the, are, are you in the chair or, or is he in the chair? I was like, Jesus is definitely out of the chair. Like I'm in the chair, like I'm the director of yeah. my life and all this stuff. And so like when they saw how I answered that question, they're like, Oh, like this guy does not get it. Right. <laughs> like this guy right. he definitely, <laughs> definitely has, you know, a little theology mixed up, but but yeah, I like I I, I wasn't saved at the time, um, and so we started doing you know men's Bible Bible studies on Wednesdays. Um, um, but one night, you know, I'm out at the bar in Gainesville, and you know I'm trying to make friends, teammates, you know um, that deal again. You know I'm falling into the same same pattern that I was in in Maryland, and um, I just hear you know a resounding voice like mm. just like resonating like in my head and this like t like telling me like asking me like what are you doing here like what are you doing here max like this was the same life that you had you know in in maryland like why why are you falling into that same pattern like do you do you think that i brought you here for the same activity do you think i brought you here for the same goal and the same purpose and in that moment, I just realized like that I had been given a second chance. Like in that moment, I, I I just like it just like all clicked, and I was just like, "What am I doing here? Like if I continue on this path, like like it's gonna lead to just destruction. It's gonna lead to failure. Um, it's gonna lead to hurt." And so after that, I went straight home. And the next day, um, someone asked like, "How do you get saved?" because I want to get saved. Wow. And I raised my hand too. I was like, yo, I'm trying to get saved too. <laughs> you were ready. <laughs> yeah, I was ready. I was ready, but I, I just kind of like, I didn't know how, but I, I knew that I was ready to surrender my life to Christ. I knew that I needed something more. I knew that, you know, partying and drinking and, and doing all those things wasn't, wasn't sustainable. I knew it wasn't, you know, um, something that was, going to make me feel good about myself at the end of the day. And it wasn't the person, you know, that I wanted people, people to think that I was. Hmm. So, um, yeah, August 3rd, uh, 2012, I surrendered my life to Christ. And obviously it hasn't, you know, my life hasn't been perfect, you know, since then it's been a lot of, you know, battles, you know, with my flesh and, but, uh, I've, I've gained so much insight. I've gained so many healthy, like loving relationships out of the people that I've met, you know, that love the Lord as well. Um, and like, I'm just so thankful for that. And so thankful for, you know, for my mom always praying for me, for, you know, my older brother and sister that, you know, just always were planting seeds, planting seeds, planting seeds in my life. Yeah. Uh, kind of just like never stop praying for me. Man, that's a great story, Max. It really is. And it's interesting how, you know, God, is, he talks about in Proverbs, he says, uh, in all your ways, acknowledge me and I will direct your path. And, you know, we like to think of that path as this perfect, smooth direction with no windy roads and just a straight drive, right? Like if you're in Arizona on one of those big highways and you're just driving for, for days and it's not like that, it's up and down and all around. It's like a roller coaster. And 
God kind of took you on your own little roller coaster there for a while, but he brought you back. What changed after you said yes? After you said, yeah, I surrender my life to Christ. That's that's the start. I tell people, mm-hmm. when you say yes to Christ, yes, that secures your, your place in heaven with him, but it's not the end. Like that's the beginning, right? So what changed for you in, in, in that beginning stage for you as you started your walk with Jesus? Oh, it was, it was, it was hard. It was really hard. It was really hard to, to kind of leave that scene. Um, I was kind of, I felt like I was, I was definitely living a double life. You know, I had my, my, my friends that I went to, you know, Bible group with, and then I had my other friends that I was still, you know, going to the bar uh, with. And like, it was this internal fight, like literally just my flesh and my spirit, just like battling every day. And that's like really what it was. It's like my spirit came alive and like, I was just like more conscientious of my, of my sin. Like I didn't, I was, you know, before I, like, I wasn't even aware of my sin. I wasn't even aware of the things that would eventually like bring me death. Right. And um, so like, it was like a whole perspective change. Like my whole like heart posture just changed. I feel like I, I just saw a wor- the world from a different perspective. Um, like I just wanted to love people more. I wanted to serve people more. Um, I wanted to be more mindful of my words. I wanted to be, um, I kind of just like, I wanted to be like less charming and like just be more real. You know, I wanted to, uh, you know, just be more authentic. And I think like, that's what, what I wrestled with the most. Um, because like, I didn't know how to live this life, like in Jesus, but like still be, but still be cool. You know, it's like still <laughs> be, still like, you know, be one of the guys. Yeah. Um, so, um, that definitely changed. And like, that was something that like I struggled with, you know, until I got to the league. Um, and so like really like a few years ago, like I started really to come into my own and like kind of just like to start to own my faith and like, just really just like live my faith out loud. How did your mom react when you told her all this? Because it was just yesterday. <laughs> was she shocked? Was she praying? Was, I mean, she's your mom. Obviously, she loves you. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking like, you know, I just told mom this, you know, that's right. she's probably surprised, but happy in the way it turned out, right? <laughs> yeah, she was like, her mouth was just open the whole time. Like, <laughs> she was just like. <laughs> oh my goodness like I just had no idea I still actually have to call her back um uh, because she wanted me to call her back after the call yeah um but yeah so we we haven't really talked about it you know formally you know uh or properly you know sure. just yet but um her natural reaction she was just like in shock well she knew the part where you're accepting Christ because you obviously your walk with the Lord is is a public walk it's it's a personal walk, but it's a public walk. Um, but yeah, to find out kind of all the details that led to that is, uh, is always interesting when you, when you share that. I'm wondering for you, you, got, you said you got to the league and it took you a couple of years. What was that like, that transition? Because college is one thing, partying, going to the bars. The NFL is a business, but you also come in contact with a different lifestyle, right? And the world will pull at you. I've talked to many athletes, you know, many of the same guys that I've talked to and the struggle is there, not just identity and trying to make the team and trying to do your best as a football player, but the pull of worldly things when suddenly you're this Denver Broncos offensive lineman in the NFL and everybody wants a piece of you. That's got to be an interesting transition. Yeah, definitely. It was, it, it was hard. It was, it's, it, it was a hard road. Um, mainly because like now, I have money and I have access right. and not even on top of the access, like people want to give me access. Like people want me to take advantage of this and that. Right. And um, like, they want me to, you know, come to the bar. They want me to drink for free. They want me to, they just want me there. You know what I'm saying? Just to, just to say like, Oh, this guy comes to my bar or this yes. guy, you know, frequents my club. And um, so, yes, yeah, it, it, it was, it was hard. It was hard. Um, just to like, you know, stay true to my values. Um, and like, I felt like every time that I got close to someone on a team who was a believer, like shortly they were gone. Like they either got, you know, cut or traded. 
mm. or, or, you know, some, something, you know, in that manner. So like building community was like super tough for me. And I'm not a person that's like, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a vocal guy. Like I, I'm definitely the dude that just like shuts up and, you know, does his work. You know, I'll kind of just like put my head down and, and just like get to it. Um, just cause I, I like, that's kind of just how I was raised. Um, so it, 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 it took me a lot to kind of like to reach out to dudes, but if somebody, you know, else was like creating a Bible study or something like, yeah, I would, I would be the, the, the first guy to support it. You know, I'd be the first guy to, you know, be there and join. So, um, yeah. So I think, you know, building community was a, was a one thing that like I had struggled with and the thing that I was missing. Um, and the one thing that I did realize was like, I can have community with guys that aren't necessarily, necessarily here physically with me. And I, I can build, I can build community with guys, you know, you know, over text, over, you know, phone calls, you know, zoom and and things like that. And I can still like be, you know, in in the presence of the Lord, even though they're like not here, you know, physically with me. And, um, uh, Jeremy, uh, my best friend, Jeremy Davis, yeah. Uh, was yeah, he's been a huge integral piece uh, in me kind of just like keeping my identity because just the way that he, you know, walks out his face, you know, so boldly. Um, so every time, you know, when I think I, I can't, you know, do do this, you know, faith thing, you know, right, you know, I, I just I just look at him and like he's always, you know, been a light for me. Um, and other guys that I've met, you know, through PAO, like Ben, Benjamin Watson, yeah, and guys like him, um, you know, just kind of, you know, walking their faith out, you know, just boldly. And like, that's like, that's, that's what I desire to have. That's good. Um, last question. What is, what has God been teaching you now? So he's brought you all the way here to 2021. Uh, and by the way, shout out to Jeremy Davis. He's the one that connected you and I, um, even though we probably cross paths at PAO quite a bit too. Um, so shout out to Jeremy. And he was on this podcast and had a great story last fall you need to go listen to. But as God has brought you to where you are here today in 2021, you're getting ready for your seventh season, uh, your third with the Cardinals. What's he teaching you today? What's he showing you today? Um, he's showing me that, um, man, there's so many things. I think that that community piece definitely yeah. is one. Um, I'm in a, a couple of Bible studies and I think, you know, attribute that to also to, you know, having things like quarantine that, you know, kind of forced us to communicate, you know, out, out, you know, and, and use technology, you know, like we're doing now. Yeah. Um, and, and to build, you know, those, those type of settings where I can be fed the word, um, He's teaching me like that I do need other people who are walking this faith out, you know, boldly every day. Um, And that, you know, I can I can confide in these people. I can confide in these groups. I can be, you know, transparent. I can be vulnerable. Um, And that it's not weakness, you know, it's strength. And a lot of that, I feel like, you know, kind of ties into mental, mental health as well. That's kind of like what I'm kind of like learning and studying and kind of um, trying to figure out, you know, what it means for me. I feel like I, in the past, you know, I kind of just like saw that and it was like, yeah, you know, like that's not really a thing that I struggle with or it doesn't really apply to me. But um, I think it definitely does. Like if you, everybody, you know, has something, you know, with mental health and Absolutely. You, can really, you can really, you know, tap into that. Um, so like in these settings, just being vulnerable with them and like just talking to them about it. Um, that's something that he's definitely been showing me that like other people are struggling with this and they do care and, uh, that you can confide, confide in your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, another one is, um, is, uh, reconciliation and forgiveness. Mm. Um, so the person that I hurt the worst uh, forgave me, um, like a few months ago. And like, literally, like I wanted this person's forgiveness, like so badly, like so, so badly. And, um, you know, she, uh, she ended up forgiving me and we ended up reconciling. And, uh, just the other, like a couple of weeks ago, um, at church, we heard, um, the pastor said like, it takes one person to forgive, but it takes two people to reconcile. That's right. And, um, 
Yeah, so definitely, you know, kind of some of the relationships that I've had in the past um, with some family members in particular, um, he's kind of showing me that he can be the God of reconciliation, like that, you know, I can, I can forgive, but like I can also have the courage and kind of like the strength to talk about how this person has wronged me and like just be transparent with them and be able to reconcile and be able to, you know, kind of just connect again. I think that's something that a lot of people don't have the chance to do, you know, especially like with the people, you know, in their families, with the people that they love or the people that, you know, they don't necessarily love because they haven't been able to form a relationship. But I'm trying to believe, you know, that, you know, God can do these, you know, in my mind, what are miracles, you know, reconciling with people that at one point, you know, I didn't even want to have in my life anymore. So wow. he's definitely showing me that he can be the God of reconciliation. Well, he, he absolutely can. That's powerful, Max. Uh, thanks for sharing, buddy. Thanks for being on the show. Uh, we'll get you back on. Hopefully we'll see a PAO and you and I can sit down and have an actual conversation in person. We'll bring Jeremy in. We'll bring a bunch of guys in and we'll go deep and we'll have a, a real good roundtable discussion on something. <laughs> and it's certainly going to be Jesus related, that's for sure. But uh, thanks for joining us, man. We'll have a uh, we'll have you back on, and all the best. Hope you have a great season with Arizona, and uh, talk to you soon. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Jason. I appreciate you. And many thanks to Max Garcia, the offensive lineman with the Arizona Cardinals, for joining us here today on the show. Really appreciate him sharing his story, his testimony, the testimony that he just shared yesterday with his mom, and here he is sharing it today with us on Sports Spectrum. And such a cool story about how God brought him really from the depths of a a very dark place and used a time at Maryland where he was kind of going through it, arrived at Florida, becomes a Christian, wants to get saved, but has that push-pull that a lot of us have in living one foot in with Jesus and one foot in with the world. Sounds like Max is uh, doing some pretty cool things now and God's brought him quite... Uh, you know, quite along on this journey to where he is today, living his life for Jesus and putting people in his life like Jeremy, uh, who was just a great dude, Jeremy Davis, who came on our show last year and actually introduced me to Max. And Jeremy played in the NFL for many years as well. And he loves Jesus too. So it's fun to watch Jeremy and Max and other guys in the league, just trying to do it right. Just trying to live for a greater purpose than just football and money and success, and accolades, and even Super Bowls, but even greater than that, to live for Jesus Christ. So thanks to Max for being here on the show today. We really appreciate him. We appreciate you for tuning in as well. Thank you. If this is the first time you're joining us here at Sports Spectrum, welcome to the show. We're so glad that you're tuning in. Do us a favor, click that subscribe button on the app that you're listening to this podcast on. That way, you never miss an episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast. We drop about three to four episodes every single week, and they all center on one thing, sports intersecting with Jesus. That's what we're about. We like to bring the sports world in. We like to bring the faith world in and intersect them, but really keeping Jesus into the sports conversation and at the center of all that we do. That's what we're about here at Sports Spectrum. If you'd like to support us, you can go to the website, sportsspectrum.com, and read our content and share our content with others, our articles, our daily devotionals, our podcasts. Just tell someone about Sports Spectrum. That is a great way to support us here at the ministry, the media ministry of Sports Spectrum. See you guys next time right here on Sports Spectrum. Have a great rest of your day.